go to our reading of Scripture, let's begin with a prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word as we read it this day. You ask that we read it, you would bless it to our understanding. Also place it in our hearts there that it might grow to you and produce good fruit. In the name of Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. First we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 9, starting with verse 9. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, which is kind of a paraphrase. Matthew 9, starting with verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's table. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I come to call those, not those who think they're righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. Then from 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 11. I mean, excuse me, start verse 3. 1 John 2, 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new commandment, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message that you have heard. Yet I'm writing you a new commandment. Its truth is to be seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they're going because of darkness has blinded them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There was a young fellow who hadn't driven very much and was just really kind of learning out on his own after he got his license. He particularly had not driven in bad weather, and so when it really started pelting snow, he got kind of worried if he'd be able to make it home or not. But then he remembered what his father told him. He said, if there snow's bad, so just get behind the snow plow and follow it and you'll be fine. You know, you know, clear the road in front of you and if you ever break down, it'll uh, you know, get you unstuck. And lo and behold, there was one. So he got behind it and followed it, just relieved as he could be. And after a while, the uh, driver stopped and got out and came back and said, are you okay? The boy said, yeah, I'm fine. So explain to him about you know, what his father had said. He goes, do you mind if I follow you? And the truck driver said, no, that's fine with me, because I'm finished here with the Walmart parking lot. If you want to come with me to the Kmart parking lot, that's fine. <laughs> That'd be me, I'd follow somebody right the parking lot. <laughs> we'll talk about following and followers a little bit today. You know, in this day of social media, people often talk about followers. You know, how many followers do you have? If you're on Facebook and you only have five followers, then that's not a lot, yeah, that's not much, is it? But if you have five people following you in the dark alley, that's a lot. <laughs> it really depends on your situation. There's kind of an old saying that may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. And that sounds kind of funny, but I'll explain it as we go here. A rabbi, of course, is a Hebrew word. It means master or teacher. And today, in the modern world, it means, of course, an ordained person of the Jewish faith. But in ancient times, it was a little less narrow in its meaning. It still meant master or teacher. But it didn't have to be somebody who was you know, specifically ordained by the temple, but just somebody who was recognized as a teacher by his disciples and such. And Jesus, we see in the scriptures, is often called rabbi and master and teacher, so he certainly was recognized as one. But calling somebody uh, a teacher or your rabbi or your master has a much deeper meaning, much more personal meaning and attachment than simply calling somebody Reverend, Reverend these days. And that's just a title maybe today. But back in those days, to be <coughs> someone 
To truly call somebody a rabbi, a master, or a teacher, like the disciples do, or even to call someone like Mary Magdalene does in the Gospel of John, my rabbi, my teacher, uh, means that you have become a member of that rabbi's household. And that was a much more life-altering decision than it might seem to us today. A household back then was more than just you and your parents and your brothers and sisters. It was all of your family. You know, not just your parents and siblings, but aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and grandchildren and all the people connected with all of them. So you weren't just living under one roof. You know, you could have a whole village of people, but you could still be just one household, depending on how you were related. The household was all that you had. There was no safety net other than that. You know, the government was sure not going to help you. Their job was to tax you and take your money. That was their sole purpose. And not to beat you up if you, if you did that. You know, they're kind of like the mafia. They'll give you a deal you can't refuse. <laughs> and there were no organizations dedicated to your relief if you failed or faltered. The only people who would look after you are your family, and you took care of them as well. Now, the household had a head of household, which was usually the oldest male, but sometimes not. We read in the book of Acts about Lydia, the seller of purple goods, uh, who was one of the first converts in the city of Thyatira in Greece, and she was apparently the head of her household. But the head of household was truly the head of the household. Their word was the law. What they said went. All honor and respect went to them. As head of the household went, so the entire household went. In ancient society, they lived in what we call a, a culture of honor and shame. Everything had honor or shame attached to it. Every household had honor or shame attached to it. The head of household's honor or shame was the honor and shame of everybody else in the household. And whatever anybody did in the household reflected back on the household and the head of the house. Even the simplest of tasks did this. It was concerned with this uh, system of honor and shame. For instance, if you went out into a marketplace and was haggling over something, and so it's not like here where you go out and you pay the price, you know, whatever it says, that's what you pay. You haggled for whatever you were going to pay for what you were getting. If the seller got the best of you, then they were honored, but you were shamed. But if you got a good deal off of them, then you got honor and they were shamed. Everything was a contest of honor and shame and brought you uh, either honor or shame, and not only you, but your whole household, and that reflected back on the head of household too. So when Jesus goes and says to the fishermen by the sea or to Matthew at his tax table today that we read, and says, follow me, that's a big decision to make. Everything rode on it because they were becoming a member of Jesus's household. You gave up everything else to be a disciple of your master. When the fishermen were called, they left their nets in the boat and followed Jesus. When Matthew was called, he left his tax collection table, his livelihood, behind and followed Jesus. Christ's honor and shame was now Matthew's honor and shame. Everything that he did reflected back on, Matthew, on, on Christ. And Jesus was now the head of his household. In short, he gave up his old life to follow Jesus. He physically went wherever Jesus went. He listened to what Jesus taught. He followed Jesus' directions and instructions and commandments. And he tried to live what he learned from the Lord. Jesus in other passages tells us that the disciples followed the Master and tried to become like them. And John in today's passage says that if we live in Christ, that is to become as much like Christ as we're possibly able to do, and to live as he did. And that's the meaning of the saying, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. It was a blessing, which was basically saying, may you travel so closely to your rabbi. May you be so close to them, following them so closely that the dust from their feet covers you. Which well, Jesus is, of course, our master, our Lord, our rabbi. Yes, he's the son of the living God. He is God the Son. He is our Savior. But as such, he is also our teacher. We rely on him not only for our salvation, but also on instruction as to how we are to live. He calls us to follow him and like the disciples before us, his goals become our goals. His priorities become our priorities. His methods become ours. His way becomes our way. And indeed, that was the initial name by which Christians were known. They were called the way. And they were called that because Jesus, of course, called himself the way, the truth, and the life. But also, it was the way to salvation and the way to live a righteous life. 
And so the way was not just a stopping point, but a journey. A journey with Jesus and a journey to Jesus. Jesus is now the head of our household with all the honor and respect due for that and with our dedication to follow him. And everything that we do and say reflects back on him and reflects back on our whole Christian family, whether we think that's fair or not. To be a disciple of Jesus, John tells us in today's scriptures, we've already mentioned this, to say we want to live like him. We want to take him not only as our savior, but as our example. And we know that the central commandment of being a Christian is what John talks about today, and that is to love one another. It's the new commandment that Jesus gives on the, the night, uh, on Monday, Thursday, we call it, before his crucifixion, in which he tells his disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. We're told that this is our calling card. Jesus says, they will know that you are my followers by the way that you love one another. Not by our clothing, not by our hairstyle, thank goodness, not for <laughs> any of our possessions, but because of our love for one another. What is that love? Well, we can read about that in, in 1 Corinthians 13. gives a beautiful definition. And I think it's summed up in this uh, passage I read from a magazine that says, Love is slow to suspect, quick to trust, slow to reprimand, quick to forbear, slow to belittle, quick to appreciate, slow to condemn, quick to justify, slow to offend, quick to defend, slow to demand, quick to give. Slow to provoke, quick to conciliate. Slow to hinder, quick to help. Slow to resent, quick to forgive. The dust of our master's feet that we pray covers us is love. His love for us and our love for him and for one another. It's this love that enables us to conquer through Jesus Christ because the world doesn't know what to do with that. The world is ready for an argument if you want to give them one. It knows how to deal with violence if you want to be violent. It can give you back hate for hate and rage for rage. But love, it has trouble dealing with. It doesn't know what to do with it. It can't overcome it. During World War II, a British general named Basil Little Hart, strange name, it's a British hat, but uh, he was a general, and after the war was over, he interviewed a large number, particularly the higher-ranking Germans, in detail, and he said one thing struck him that the Germans mentioned, and that was they always said that the Nazis knew how to deal with violent resistance. They met it with violence. But they could never adequately deal with peaceful, loving resistance like that shown them by the Danes and the Norwegians who didn't take up arms and, and try a violent way, but instead passively resisted, lovingly protecting those that the Nazis sought to harm. And they could never deal with that. Adequate. They didn't know what to do with it. Love always overcomes. And that is our calling card as Christians, as followers of Jesus. Jesus calls us to join his household to come and follow him. To do so is to join his household to take him as Lord. What we do, that's the question we've asked ourselves today. We follow him. May you be covered in the dust of your master's feet. Let us pray. Lord, indeed, help us to follow you. Lord, we will oftentimes take one step back for every two forward. But Lord, we ask that you would give us strength to walk as you call us to. To walk in forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. Help us, Lord, to follow you so closely that we are covered by the dust of your feet. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.